in the wedge document, the goals of the Center for Science and Culture were to defeat scientific materialism and its destructive moral, cultural, and political legacies, to replace materialistic explanations with a theistic understanding that nature and human beings are created by God. This was from their website. That's where I got it. It also showed up in a very interesting document called the Wedge Document, which was a fundraising um, uh, document that the Discovery Institute prepared for an unknown funder. It was leaked. It showed up on the web. And it re it's their five-year plan. They wrote, design theory promises to reverse the stifling dominance of the materialist worldview and to replace it with a science consonant with Christian and theistic convictions. This is not a mere scientific movement. It is a movement to promote a specific sectarian Christian theology. Philip Johnson makes this very clear that fighting philosophical materialism is the goal of the movement. I have built an intellectual movement in the universities and churches that we call the Wedge, which is devoted to scholarship and writing that furthers this program of questioning the materialistic basis of science. But science has a methodological basis, not a philosophical basis of materialism. But that's not what these folks believe. In Johnson's book, The Wedge of Truth, he talks about how evolution can be used as a wedge issue. If you can attack evolution, if you can make people believe that evolution is bad science, that scientists have been lying to you about evolution, that evolution is shaky stuff, then you can attack the materialist basis of science itself. In other words, we can break open science. We can wedge science op open, like a splitting ball in a wedge. We can wedge open science to allow in God as an explanatory agent if we can destroy evolution. And once we destroy the, the materialist, methodological materialist basis of science, then we can destroy the philosophical materialism of society. This is what the wedge strategy is all about, and this is what intelligent design is all about. Now, this movement is quite active. There are lots and lots of books and videotapes and other materials. Uh, they just sort of keep going and going and going. Um, they have been very active in their publishing, but also in trying to get intelligent design into state science education standards. There are a number of books that critique intelligent design, not as many as that are for um, Forrest and Gross, uh, Creationism's Trojan Horse on the Wedge Strategy, Young and Edis, Why Intelligent Design Fails, um, Robert Pennock's Intelligent Design Creation and Its Critics, and his earlier book, um, Tower of Babel, God, the Devil, and Darwin by Nell Shanks, a very, very good book, which unfortunately does not project very well, The Creation, Evolution, excuse me, The Counter-Creationism Handbook by Mark Isaac, a very good book, Finding Darwin's God by Ken Miller, Defending Evolution for Teachers by Brian and Sandra Alters, and my book, Evolution and Creationism. <laughs> a most wonderful thing happened on Sunday. I have to share this with you. On Sunday, Evolution versus Creationism was actually reviewed in the New York Times book review section. I mean, this is so incredibly huge. Now, just among us friends, I didn't like the overall article, but she said such nice things about my book. I'm not going to criticize it, OK? So you know, the New York Times book review is the sun, it's just it's this huge. I mean, I'm about to have, um, I, I, I'm about to, who's, who's that actor? Um, um, Tom, I'm about to have a Tom Cruise moment here and just jump up and down. <laughs> no. But of course, everything, every author who gets his or her book reviewed in the New York Times goes to Amazon, right? Sunday night, my book reached 284 on the Amazon bestseller list. <laughs> Of course, you have to know that this is totally meaningless. Okay, <laughs> If your book stays under 1,000 for two weeks, you've sold a lot of books. This is Sunday night. Only geeks buy books Sunday night, right? <laughs> and so geeks are buying my book. But I know geeks buy my book. So, but, but it's still, I made a slide, obviously, because this is just so incredibly exciting. 
In addition to all of the books by scientists critique and intelligent design, I do want to call your attention to the fact that there are a number of books in theology which also don't like intelligent design. Many of them by Jack Haught, who was one of the um, witnesses for the good guys in Kitzmiller versus Dover, God After Darwin is um, one of his books. He's written quite a few. Finding Gar Darwin's God by um, uh, Ken Miller. Perspectives on an Evolving Creation is a very important book by Keith Miller, who is a geologist at Kansas State. This is a book primarily by evangelicals accepting evolution. And the idea that evangelical Christians accept evolution, there's a bunch of them out there, they're trying very, very hard to convince their fellow evangelicals that you can be a faithful and conservative Christian and still accept evolution. I say thank you. This is a very good book if you have a conservative Christian friend who is concerned about evolution. Um, Peters and Hewlett is also a very good book that I would recommend, another book by Jack Hott. Good place where you can find lots of information about intelligent design is talkorigins.org and pandasthumb.org. I would recommend both of these. And of course, I would recommend the NCSE website, which is ncseweb.org. If you go there, you'll see this lovely bright blue page, because blue is my favorite color. You go to the newsroom, you get all the really depressing stuff. You can sort by year. So if you want to know what happened in 2003, you can pull out stuff. If you want to select for state of interest, you can go and pull down Michigan and find out what happened in Michigan. You can go to resources and find all sorts of stuff about creation and intelligent design. And it's full of lots of good information. I would encourage you to learn more about it. We just opened a new part of our website. If you uh, go to the web and you go to the um, upper right hand teaser box there, Evolution, Education, and the Law has got the transcripts and the witness statements and all the briefs and uh, decisions in the Kitzmiller trial, plus the Selman trial and other materials. I want to thank my staff, Eric Mickle, Wesley Ellsbury, Susan Spath, Nick Motsky, who lived out of a suitcase for six weeks in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania during the trial, and Glenn Branch, my deputy director, who make me look good and who do a whole lot of very important work, I think, in helping people to understand the creation and evolution controversy and maybe some things we can do about it. And I'm very impressed at how you put up with this very long talk so patiently. Thank you so much for coming today. The question had to do with a case that came up a couple weeks ago in El Tajon, California, near Bakersfield, where a teacher was teaching an intercession class, a four-week intercession class, on philosophy of intelligent design. The idea being that, well, Kitzmiller versus Dover says you can't teach evolution as science. Let's just teach it, excuse me, you can't teach intelligent design as science. Therefore, we'll teach it in a philosophy class. Well, what the court said is that you cannot, what the First Amendment says is you cannot advocate, promote a religious position in the public schools. You cannot advocate intelligent design in science class. You can't advocate it in a philosophy class. She was advocating intelligent design. This was the two model approach. She was contrasting intelligent design as a valid scientific uh, theory with evolution as an invalid scientific theory and letting the students decide and just calling it philosophy. What was even funnier is that she didn't even know what intelligent design was. She used the title, and she was basically using materials from Answers in Genesis. She was using creation science stuff. It's just, um, you can find material on this on our website as well.